Char, I, I need to tell this kind of a story, I guess. Um, we were going to uh, one of the handy events at First Methodist, right? And I ran up on Charles, and we sat together. And I said, if you ever need anything, Charles, let me know. By George, the phone rang. <laughs> there, are, there are certain people that I can't turn down, and Charles Moore's one. The late Bill McDonald was another one. I owed that man so much. And uh, so Billy Ray Warren's another one. When he has something, I have to go do it. My wife definitely is one of those in that category. So um, I told Charles, I, I don't have a whole lot to say about archaeology. I'm not th that well versed. I, I, we do the local history course, um, and I am advertising. If you've never had that course for UN, through UNA, it starts the last Thursday night of, Octo of, of this month, September, and runs for six nights, six Thursday nights. So it begins with the Indians and the, and the prehistoric uh, history of the area. So that's about the limit of my knowledge of archaeology. Uh, but um, I, during COVID, uh, we could not do one-on-one -on -one classroom teaching. So Dr. Tom Osborne, Professor Emeritus at UNA, and I got together. About three years ago, he called me one day and he said, uh, let's go to lunch, I want to talk to you. And so we went, sat down, had something to eat, and he said, have you ever thought about doing a series on uh, economic depressions and pan oh, they used to be called panics? And I said, really, I haven't. And he said, well, let's do it. So what we did for COVID for the ILR, Institute of Learning and Retirement, is that he did the national and international view, and I did the state and local view. Uh, so this is how this all came about. We did uh, six programs on the major economic disasters in American history. So um, Charles said, what's the program going to be? <laughs> and I said, well, we'll just call it the founding of Florence and the Panic of 1819. Um, and the reason they call them panics is because it scared the living daylights out of people. It just happened so quick people panicked. And now we have other terms. We went, then went from panic to depression. And they thought, well, that's not a real good. Now it's called recession. So you have these up and downs economically, and people, really smart people, are trying to figure out why and how to prevent them, and we still haven't got total control. So um, another name for this is called the hard times. Stephen Foster had a song called the hard times. Don't visit me no more. So um, the period right after the War of 1812. The War of 1812 is kind of a misnomer. It's, it starts at 1812 in America, but it had already been going on in Europe between predominantly England, France, and those power brokers of Europe. But then in America, it ends abruptly in 1815. So the war doesn't, it continues a little bit in Europe after that. But the crowning blow of the War of 1812 was Jackson's Battle of New Orleans. And you remember the irony of that? Anybody remember that irony? The war was already over. And nobody knew it. And, nobody knew it. and all of those British soldiers were killed for nothing. But what it did is it skyrocketed Andrew Jackson to fame. And it literally took him to the White House. Um, one of the great things about, and we were talking about, this Jackson and I were talking about Andrew Jackson. You know, you realize that he's one of a very small handful of American officers who never had one day of military training? Not one day. He's militia. And he never lost a fight that he commanded. How about that? Pretty interesting. He had some pretty good guys with him too. John Coffey, David Crockett. Those were a lot of those Tennesseans with those big rifles you were talking about that were accurate for a long... What would they call them? They'd say bark over here and bite way out there. Remember that? Yeah. yeah. 
the British said they'd, they'd hear it bark over here and somebody died out there. That's how accurate they were. So, following the War of 1812, this time, this was a period of great optimism. Um, patriotism. We have one, another event with the biggest, most powerful empire in the world, Great Britain. Some people said that this war should have been called the Second War of American Independence. You see, the first time we won our political freedom from England, but they bullied us for years economically, treating us like a stepsister or stepchild. Well, this was, this was an economic, a lot of the War of 1812 was over economics and shipping because they raided our ships on the high seas and just bullied us. Well, this put a stop to that. So this period in American history is called the Era of Good Feeling. And it was fueled by this great patriotic period and it was uh, over the, our victory in the war, but it also was fueled by, and it encouraged a tremendous economic boom following the war with westward expansion over the Appalachians. And the, um, one of the spoils of war was over two million acres of virgin land taken from the Creek Indians. The Creeks had allied themselves with Great Britain. And as a result, defeated by Andrew Jackson at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend and Talladega and others, they had to surrender over two million acres of territory. And the interesting thing was many of the Creeks, there were two factions. Don't forget, there was the Red Stick Creeks who were for war, and there were the non-Red Sticks who were helping us. But both sides lost territory. Over half what we call Alabama, they lost in that war. So, um, this was the Treaty of Fort Jackson, August 1814. So during this war, when the war was going on, government land sales went straight to the bottom. But if following the defeat of the Creeks in Alabama, oh, and by the way, do you remember a saying called, good Lord willing and the, doesn't say creek doesn't rise, does it? Creeks don't rise. It has nothing to do with floods. It's the Creek Indians. Good Lord willing and the creeks don't rise. Because they spread terror throughout this territory. They are allies, double head. Those boys. That's where that saying came from, folks. We thought for years it was the creek out here, Cypress Creek. No, it's the creeks don't rise. I thought it was pretty phenomenal. But anyway, this, this is called Alabama fever. Um, it swept the nation. All this virgin land is now open for sale. And there's a story that whole counties in North Carolina and Virginia were almost depopulated overnight. People simply put a note on the door, gone to Alabama, packed up and left. Because they had worn that land out in the Carolinas and in Virginia. And so here we have all this land available. So from 1810 to 1820, there was a 1,000% increase in the population of Alabama. 1,000%. The population in 1820 rose to 127, 901 people. It was boom time. President Monroe and Congress rewarded Andrew Jackson for his service with command of the Alabama Territory. And in turn, he appointed General John Coffey, his attache, with the post of Surveyor General of all of North Alabama stationed in Huntsville. So Coffee moves from Murfreesboro with his family and goes to Huntsville and opens up the federal land office. So this land office saw an explosion of land sales, mostly for agricultural purposes and king cotton. Cotton was booming. The lure was virgin land. 
and high cotton prices and the dreams of wealth. People are going to get rich. And this is one method. So before the land was surveyed and offered for sale, there was a huge wave of squatters that came in and yeoman farmers. The yeoman farmers were the smaller farmers who could not afford vast parcels of land, but families would go together and buy a, a whole section and divide it up so that each family member had a small farm, small independent yeoman farmers. But squatters were people who could not afford the land. They came ahead of civilization, cleared the land, built cabins, planted their crops, and when civilization caught up to them, they packed up and went further west. So coffee had a huge influx here of both squatters and yeomen. And the whole, this whole area along the Tennessee Valley was attractive. The Tennessee Valley region was one of the most thickly populated regions in this Alabama territory. Along with the Tom Bigby, the Black Warrior Tom Bigby, the Alabama River section, and the Chattahoochee. And you understand why. It's rich bottomland the fertile soils. So it's interesting, life on this frontier was very wild and reckless and dangerous due to disease and the lack of clergy and almost no law and order. Corn was the staple crop because of its multiple use for both man and beast. And whiskey was mass produced, massly consumed and traded and sold as a commodity a method or a means of finance. You could buy and trade whiskey. Life was particularly hard for women and children because of the lack of money, the lack of uh, schooling, and uh, the fact that they owned no slaves and that they were used almost for labor. When the new territory was finally surveyed, land was offered for sale in the Huntsville Land Office. And some of the most feverish activity there concerned the Muscle Shoals. And it was believed that who could buy the Muscle Shoals would be able to build a city, a town that would be a, at, the, at, the, at the head of navigation. Steamboats or the future steamboats could only come this far in and, and low water. So this would be a spot for entrepreneurs, if you will. If we could get our hands on that, we could make a lot of money. So there were competing bids for this. And one of the most desired places, of course, was here. Um, and one of the reasons for that is the uh, ability to ship your crops out of here by river. Um, south of here, at the fall line, where you got the Black Warrior and the Tom Bigby, it was easy to get your goods to Mobile. But here, you had to float them up or down, the Missis down to Tennessee into the Ohio and then down the Ohio and into the Mississippi to New Orleans. So this led to a very early cry and you can go back and find it as early as 1815 and 1816 there were people talking about if we just dug a canal between the Tennessee and the Tom Bigby we could be in Mobile. Hmm. I think that later came to become Tim Tom, right? So this was already going on as early as 1815. Out of this frenzy of called Alabama fever, two competing land companies surfaced. One was called the Tennessee Land Company and the other the Alabama Land Company. They combined their forces and created what's called Cypress Land Company. Uh, they did this March the 12th, 1818. Now many of us believe that's the birthday of Florence on paper right there because they are the ones that are going to buy the land. Their motives for combining were very simple. You're, you have more money by putting two companies together and you don't have to bid to drive the prices up against them. So they outbid pretty much everybody else. When they drew up their articles of association it was drawn up by John Overton, prominent Nashville attorney and law partner of Andrew Jackson. Uh, and, he, and both Andrew Jackson and Overton were land speculators. Now, there were, there were a couple of ways to make money at this time. The stock market had already been created. 
But here in Tennessee and Alabama territory, you didn't play the stock market. You bought land, hopefully to sell it later. You bought and traded slaves. And you sold cotton. Grew cotton or other cash crops to make money as much as quickly as possible. So a speculator is just like anybody today. They buy it hoping to make a profit. So this is the whole purpose. The Articles of Association created the following seven men as trustees. Leroy Pope, that name ought to be very familiar to you, out of Huntsville. Thomas Bibb, brother would become governor of Alabama. Uh, he lived in Mon near Monroe, is it Monroeville? Monroeville, yeah, lived right out near Monroeville. John McKinley from Virginia would later become the first Alabamian and the only man from Florence to be on the Supreme Court. They represented the Tennessee Land Company. The Alabama Company was made, oh, excuse me, they represented the Alabama Company. The Tennessee Company was made up of men like John Coffey, James Jackson, John Childress, and a man named Dabney Morris. Three of those people came out of Nashville, out of the Nashville area. Um, so the Cypress Land Company purchased from the federal government 5,515.77 acres and paid $85,235.24, or $15.50 per acre. That was outrageous. Because you could buy good land for $5. And they're paying $15.50? This is that competition. Alabama fever has driven... This is also called inflation. We know about inflation right now, don't we? Look at gas prices. Look at diesel prices. Everything's gone up. Because they can. So here's what you find. This, with this purchase, this company was the largest purchaser of federal government land in all of North Alabama. There's not a larger purchase in all of North Alabama. But federal law required you had to pay one-fourth down. Come up with it immediately. So one-fourth of that money is $21,308.81. So they had then three years to make three more payments and pay it off. To raise the money... They came up with this figure. They would sell 408 shares of stock for $52.23 apiece. You do the math, it works out to be a couple of pennies more than what they had to have. And why they chose 408 shares, I have no idea. But they sold 408 shares. And most of the shares were purchased by these seven men, the trustees. You're buying stock to make a profit. And they will make a good profit later. So they, empower, they were empowered to survey the town, which would become Florence, conduct two land sales within five years of each other, and establish terms of credit. They were to receive, for their effort, 5% of the profits. So when it was all the dust was settled, they would get 5% of the profits to divide among the seven men. General Coffey, in his role as surveyor general, began to survey the city uh, that would become Florence in April of 1818. His assistants were James Weekly, Hunter Peel, and a young Italian engineer named Ferdinand Sonona. A name that should be very famous. The first land sale was not held here, it was held in Huntsville. And it was held July the 22nd, 1818, and lasted for four days. On the 25th, of July, the newspaper in Huntsville called the Alabama Republican said, the first 52 lots sold for over $85,000. What did they pay for it all? 85,000 plus. So in one day, they sold 52 lots and made all that money back. I got to imagine there did these dreams of sugar plums dancing in their head. How rich are we? Are we going to be able to count all this money? What we know is that the total, all four days, grossed $225,000. The majority of the sales were on credit. 
according to the terms required by the federal government, you bought land for the Cypress Land Company, you had to pay one-fourth down, and you had three years to pay off your debts. Because that's how the company bought the land from the government. So from the very beginning, the largest purchasers of land at this auction were three men. John McKinley, James Jackson, and John Coffey. I wonder if a federal land surveyor who purchased land today, would that be a conflict of interest? Michael? It's Saturday trading. It's Saturday But it wasn't back then. The federal land surveyor knew where the best land was. And his buddy was James Jackson, who would walk on a piece of property later called the Forks of Cypher. And his buddy was McKinley, who would become a member of the Supreme Court later. It doesn't hurt if you've got a friend on the Supreme Court. Without a doubt, the future looked very bright for this company. This was an economic boom largely fueled by inflation. Easy credit, but trouble was brewing. Between economic forces beyond us, international forces, the war, national economic forces, and social classes, the haves versus the have-nots, the rich versus the poor. Early in the history of this territory, a group of very wealthy planters arrived in Huntsville from an area called the Broad River region of Georgia. And they became known simply as the Georgia Faction. Or in Alabama history, they became known as the Royal Party. They were a political group, a social group. So they very quickly filled all the political, all the economic, and social voids in North Alabama. Quick. They, they and their friends and their family. They are referred to in a lot of southern history as the Celtic Mafia. It has nothing to do with the Mafia we know about today, but it has to do with these Celtic, Irish, Scotch-Irish, Welch, who come to America and get rich and take over everything. All the political offices, all the banks, all the social events, they run them. And this group ran Huntsville. Huntsville has already been created. The, the group was led by William Crawford, who would become a governor, a senator, United States senator, Leroy Pope, Thomas Bibb, and John Walker. John Walker, who was Pope's son-in-law. The, so these men purchased not only the most productive land in and around Huntsville during the Huntsville land sale of 1809. See, their land sale had already occurred in 1809, and these guys bought up the best. But they very quickly became the enemies of the squatters and the yeomen because the squatters and the yeomen were in Huntsville first. They cleared the land. Then these guys come and buy it and kick them off. One of those places around the Big Spring, very productive area. Socially, these four men of Huntsville were quickly labeled as arrogant and haughty. They were known to parade around Huntsville in a four-wheel cart to display their wealth. Leroy Pope even had the nerve to try to rename it, what? Twickingham, after a town in England. It failed, but he, he wanted to rename the city Twickingham. So in Huntsville today, there's a Twickingham Historic District. So December of 1816, the Mississippi Territorial Legislature authorized a branch, of, a branch bank of the President, Directors, and Company of Planters and Merchants Bank in Huntsville with Leroy Pope as president. During that period of wild spending, and inflation, this bank, this Huntsville Bank, issued paper notes credited to the wealth, their wealthy friends and family. On the national scene, the number of created banks, this is banks now, uh, that private banks, 
increased from 88 in 1811 to 208 in 1815. By the time the panic hit, there were over 400 private banks. We had a national bank, but these private banks weren't governed by the national bank. They were governed by people like Leroy Pope, who were loaning money to their friends and their family on easy terms. You've heard that one before. So on this, so we have now these banks issued worthless paper money, their own paper money, if you will, not supported by gold or silver, which was called specie. In other words, well, I'll give you an example. This bank had. I had a line. Let me give you this figure, and I'll come back here with it. Well, it, it's shortly coming up. I have. They outspent their own reserves by about four to one, giving it out in credit. And when it all comes crashing down, they people can't pay. So when the panic hit nationally, the Bank of the United States responded by demanding credit payments from state and private banks to be paid only in gold and silver. So the national bank said, whoa, you're issued too many credits, so now you owe us money, you got to pay us in gold and silver. Poor people don't have gold and silver. They got paper. You've heard of that saying, it ain't worth the paper it's printed on? That's where that came from, this panic. This credit is not worth the paper it's printed on. So, quickly these banks, these local banks, responded by demanding the people that borrowed money from them to pay them in gold and silver. And you don't have it. Credit in Alabama was financed mainly through three banks one of which was the Huntsville Bank from 1816 to 1819. The Huntsville Bank was supported by two banks, a bank in Tennessee and a bank in Kentucky. So when the National Bank asked the Tennessee and Kentucky banks for their money, they in turn asked the Huntsville Bank for their money. And then the Huntsville Bank asked Charles for his money. You bought it from me. Pay up. And you don't got it. What you've got is 160 acres of land that you can't pay for. What's, this, what's the timeline you're in right now? Is it 1815 to 1818? We're, 18, we're in 1818, 1819. Okay. And this panic has hit in 1819, and it's running wild. So that's why all these lots in Florence went back to the, to the original owners. Yeah. So... In, in South Alabama, they had banks supporting the South Alabama, Alabama like the Mobile Banks and Tom Bigby Banks, supported by banks out of Georgia and South Carolina. And the same thing happened there. The National Bank demanded their money, then these Georgia South Carolina banks demand their money. And it is a domino effect with the poor farmer holding an empty sack. Piece of paper not worth the money it's printed on. In August of 1819, the Huntsville Bank had a capital investment of $164,000. That means that's all the money they had. They had loaned $408,000. They can't even cover their loan. So the National Bank is asking the Huntsville Bank for its money and gold and silver, and the Huntsville Bank has issued almost four times what they had in reserve. So, so the loans that they were extending were extended on notes or currency issued to the bank? Right. Okay. Yeah, the private bank's currency, not federal money, we would call greenbacks. So, they weren't, so that would not have been backed by No, it was backed by nothing. It's an empty sack. This, quote, paper money, like we said, it's not worth the paper it's printed on. Can't you say that about money now? Well, you could closely say it. <laughs> yeah. So, 
I'm going to tie all this together because we're, we're facing some economic situations today where it's beginning to look very familiar. So, the crisis became so bad that the United States Secretary of the Treasury, a man named William Crawford, called the Huntsville Bank officers public swindlers. This is what he said. Who they think of themselves as being reputable after practicing fraud, not only upon the federal government, but upon the unfortunate and the needy. They're frauds. Yep. He was involved in some scheme, and I don't remember the exact scheme, but he was definitely involved in that Roy Pope. But Roy Pope was considered a scoundrel, particularly if you were poor. Now, if you were in the know, Roy Pope was your friend. He walked in pretty tall cotton, as the old saying goes. Lived in the finest house in Huntsville. But when he went down the street during the panic, he was booed and rocks were thrown. There was even threats on his life because he was the bank president. Okay, so eventually this bank was forced to close in 1825, largely due to the panic and reckless management. And Pope quickly became the lightning rod for all complaints. It's his fault. And Alabama is the epicenter of land speculation in the United States at this time. The Cypress Land Company is its shining example of land speculation. They are the ones that bought the largest chunk of land. The panic quickly affected the Cypress Land Company, when land purchasers were unable to pay them. You had to pay a fourth down. Remember, that was done before the panic. But now you've got three more payments coming. What happens if the bank says to you, you've paid a fourth, I need the other, and you can't pay? I think that's called foreclosure. Correct? And you're seeing this begin to be this domino effect. Hard times hit everyone and everything. John McKinley of the Cypress Land Company said that the company had at least $24,000 of bad credit given to them. Pub public land sales increased from $2 million in 1815. Let's give you an idea how how feverish this was. In 1815, the federal government only sold $2 million worth. In 1818, they had sold $13.6 million worth. And the price of that land was going this way. But the panic is hit, and the value of that land is down here now. But you paid here. When I taught economics, I, I sometimes had to get real creative and we would use paper money in my class, like monopoly money. And when students have a pile of money and I start taking it away, they begin to panic. Even though it's play money. You gave it to me, now you're taking it back. So this is the first time in American history we had this kind of episode. This is America's first depression. So in addition to this, get this, in 1819, the government sold, just in 1819 alone, $7,255,204 worth of public land, all purchased on inflated paper money. All purchased with one-fourth down and three-fourths paid later. Cotton prices during this time Oh, excuse me, in early 1820, they had $22 million in land debts. Half of that amount was in Alabama alone. Half of the government's federal land debt was in Alabama. Alabama fever is now Alabama bust. 
That's correct. But the fever is now bust because of the panic. So, cotton prices have dropped from 25 cents a pound to 10 cents a pound. Outcries from almost every section of the country demanded reform and relief. And Congress responded with the first of four land acts. The Land Act of 1820 ended buying land on credit. That's it. You can't buy no more federal land on credit which puts the little guy out. Correct? You can't buy it because you, you don't have any money. Which means those who have, have more now. You ever notice that in hard times, people who have get more and people who don't have get less? That's just the way economics run. And this is being seen right here in this area as this town is founded. The act that required purchasers of public land who directly bought it from the government were entitled to a 37.5% discount. So you bought it at an inflated price. Now they're going to reduce that debt by 37.5% and give you four more years to pay it. That's the Cypress Land Company. They get that 37.5%. Purchasers of property from these companies were given a 20% discount and a four-year extension. So you bought land from the Cypress Land Company, you now get 20% discount of what you owe and four more years to pay. This act was called the Relief Act of 1821. And also that act allowed the company the Cypress Land Company and all other companies who bought from the federal government, one way you could reduce your debt is to return some of the land back to the government. And this is how the government wound up with so much land that was not sold. It was refunded. So to reduce your debt, you could send them back so many acres. We're not real sure because the accurate records don't exist because of a fire, but we do know that the Cypress Land Company did return some of that 5,515 acres, but we're not really sure how much. So we can't find that in congressional records? Anymore? You probably could, but it's records of the company. They don't exist like that. The fire, they had a, a massive fire. Right. Mm -hmm. So, the, the infamous traveler of the West and eventual female newspaper woman, Ann Royal. We, we, her, her book was called Letters from Alabama that I encourage you to read. She visited Florence in 1821. And she said, Florence, now remember, the, the panic hits in 1819 and, and literally sweeps the country. And so she describes in 1821, Florence is a boom town. She said, uh, there is commerce everywhere. The river traffic there are people going to and fro, and she observed that every day I would pass small houses being erected, and they would be started at daylight, and the roof was on by nightfall. She said this is a sure sign of progress. So Florence and other towns of the Tennessee Valley continued to suffer despite the economy improving. The after effects of this depression went on as well, well into 1823. So according to the Articles of Association of the Cypress Land Company, they were to hold another land auction within five years of the first one. So following a publicized campaign, the, sec the 1823 land sale attracted what was called a small but respectable crowd. By the way, it was held in Florence. Because by this time, John Coffey has moved from Huntsville to Florence. And the land office is on Tennessee Street. And it says, uh, in the first day, they only sold $85,000 worth of lots. Now, remember something. They paid the original inflated price of $85,000. So here we are later, and they just collected $85,000 in deflated money. 
worth a lot more. No, they can't buy on credit anymore. This is cash money, which is a sign that people are buying, spending money again. In addition, that in, at the end of the year, 1823, they had sold $324,000 worth of lots in Florence of not inflated money. So the vision of the men who founded the Cypress Land Company is paying off. They're going to make a bunch of money. Real soon, they're going to call in the stock, and they're going to pay. You, pay, you paid $52 and some odd cents. They're going to give you $350 for that piece of stock. That's a good chunk of change. So they, they were approaching five times their investment at this point. Yes, five, five times. Almost 500%. They have survived the panic of 1819. And you know, we always hear this. You, if you can survive the hard times, you know, good times are ahead. But you've got to understand, those that didn't survive it are suffering even worse by this time. Now, these squatters that are no longer here, they're in Mississippi and Louisiana going west. So this, this helped me understand something. I did the history of the Keaton House and the firm. Mm -hmm. And I dug, I dug through the original records. The Weasleys owned that property originally. Okay. It went back to Miss Weasley's control five times from 1819 to 1829. Five different times. They foreclosed. People for foreclosed. They foreclosed on it. Yeah. And the other thing I found out at the bottom of that foundation has nothing to do with any of this, but the original log cabin foundation is where the 1901 house sits today. So really? It's, it's sitting on that log cabin foundation. Really? Yeah, five, five times. Yeah, well, that just il illustrates this whole point. I got drunk there when I was <laughs> There you go. I still do. <laughs> so, this interesting, it's, it, w what was seen by many locals as the end of this first depression, called a, a panic or hard times, is now called a depression. We call it a depression or a recession. The panic turned out to not be a solitary episode, but the first of a series of boom and bust patterns in American history that came to be known as the business cycle. In economics, you'll hear something about the business cycle, a term that carries with it the sense of inevitability that even this will occur regularly and predictably if we can, are lucky. Sad to say, there would be more panics or depressions occurring in 1837, 1873, and that one lasted until 1896. You do the math, that's 23 years. 1907, and of course the Great Depression of 1933. That lasted into, from 1929 into World War II. So as a sidelight, okay, in the middle of all this, the Forks of Cyprus, owned by the Irish immigrant James Jackson, was begun in mid-1819, finished in late 1821 or early 1822. It never slowed him down. He, was, he had what was called the Midas touch. Some say that no matter what, he made money. And when he died in 1840, he was regarded as Alabama's wealthiest, wealthiest man. So what were some effects, real quickly? The effects of this panic were almost continuous. I mean, the panic's over by 1823, 1824, but there's some things that are going to really hit. You have the national election of 1824 and 1828 when Andrew Jackson will serve two terms as president. He hates banks. And he will kill, legislatively kill the National Bank, which in result, results in the Depression of 1837. Because when they killed that National Bank, there was no more federal currency, and we went right back to money, paper money not worth what it was printed, paper was printed on. So there's a lesson about learning from the past and not, create, not 
recreating or not reliving the same thing? Trying to improve from upon that? The panic of 1819 led to sectionalism in America because the North suffered industrially, the South suffered agriculturally. And despite all of this, there's a national issue that has just hit the fan in 1820. It's called the Missouri Compromise. It is about whether slavery can go into the Western territories. So the panic has overridden an issue that's about to rise to the top, slavery, and whether or not it will be allowed in the West. Also, there is the tariff issue. The North generally favors the tariff to protect their industry, but the South, which has the agriculture, exports most of its agriculture to Europe, and in return, they don't want to pay a high tariff when they have to bring those products back here. So another issue that drives a wedge between the North and the South. All of this, of course, will culminate in the Civil War. It has its roots. Right here. It's economic, too. Right. It, and it all, the seeds of this are planted here. So, don't, here's, so here's my question. I guess I want to end with a question. How does the economic situation of today look to you? I guess I'm I guess I, I'm an optimist in many ways, and then I think about pessimistically. Are we one day going to have your children and grandchildren reading about a panic of, of 19, 2022, 2023, 24? Look at yeah, look at the debt. Look at the national debt. Look at the international ramifications of our debt. We don't even own ourselves anymore. <laughs> These guys would turn over in their graves. And they would say, what are you thinking? Charles, I appreciate you inviting me.